our service today, friends. We're really glad that you're here with us, no matter who you are, where you are, or when you are watching. We hope that you feel welcome as a part of our faith community. We have a very special service today, speaking of welcome. This week in Moose Jaw is Pride Week. We are celebrating the great diversity of humanity. And with that, today we have what we call in St. Andrews our service of inclusion. So we hope that you enjoy our service today and please join with us in prayer. Holy God, you are without beginning or ending. We celebrate that you are beyond definition or understanding. We celebrate that you are always more, more loving, more redeeming, more infused with creative energy. We celebrate that in your love, you have made your people hard to define. A rich spectrum of gifts, ways of, to love, self-expression and ways to worship you. Inspire us to keep our minds and hearts open to your surprise, to the new thing that you are doing, to the new earth that you are creating, and how we are called to participate. We pray to you, who is our mother and our father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn today is When Hands Reach Out and Fingers Trace. tools. Maybe you do too. And I have one that is particularly ugly and beat up. It's my old sieve that I use to sift compost. It's just four boards screwed together with a screen stapled on the bottom. I keep thinking I'm going to make a newer, fancier one, maybe one that gives me a few less slivers. But as simple as it is, it just works. 
I use it to sift out all the stuff that didn't break down. The pine cones and branches and avocado skins. What gets through goes into the garden to nourish the soil and then what's left in the screen gets thrown back into the compost to rot some more or is tossed into the trash. This sifting really is useful, but not just in gardening, but in many, many parts of life. Sifting out the metaphoric branches and stones that choke off new life from that which is nourishing and beautiful. For compost, it's a one half inch mesh. But what about if we are sifting our understanding of the Bible? What could we use to sift out, sift out bad or harmful theology and interpretation so that we're left with a Bible that is nourishing and life-giving. I think in this case, Paul, the author of many of the letters written to many first century churches, might be on to something. Paul was trying to sort out some conflict in the church of Corinth. There were great people in the church. Most of the people were just fantastic. They were generous and talented but they started feuding over who was the most talented, the most generous, who deserved the most praise for the role that they played. One would say that they gave up their home to be used as the church meeting place, and so they, of course, deserve the most credit. Another would boast of their ability to teach, and this went on and on and on. This church full of really good people started to tear itself apart. Paul responds with a common theme in his letters, that we are all given gifts from God and they are all needed. So forget trying to determine some kind of hierarchy between us. That said, he also says that there are a few gifts that are more important than the others but that doesn't divide us either because these are the gifts that are given to all people. Faith, hope, and love. And this brings us to today's reading. Very famous if you've ever been to a wedding. From the 13th chapter of the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. If I speak in tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part. Then, we will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. And the greatest of these is love. So you've got this great big compost pile of biblical interpretation. You want to sift it to make sure that your understanding is pretty accurate 
But a metal screen doesn't sift our thoughts. No, we need to use an attitude, an idea, a belief to sift out all the garbage. I think the screen that we must use is love. Does my understanding of what the Bible says create a more loving world? Does my interpretation lead me to be more loving to my neighbor? Yes. Well, then it makes it through the screen in order to nourish our lives. If it doesn't make me more loving, then it probably won't get through the screen and is going to end up being thrown into the trash. And Paul isn't making this stuff up. He's following the example of the master. Jesus, too, is all about the law of love, using love as the filter through which to enrich our lives. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as, I love, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus also tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our heart and soul and strength and mind, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Maybe this is like my garden sieve. Maybe some might think that this is just too simple. We have, after all, been debating Christian truth for 2,000 years. How could it be that all we need to do is see if it fits love? Shouldn't it be more complicated? Shouldn't there be exceptions? Well, when Paul, or when Jesus was asked about loving our neighbors and who that neighbor might be, Jesus talked about a neighbor being someone who would otherwise be hated, the ultimate outsider, the people that, the, that the, those listening to Jesus would have known would have to be the villain in the story. Jesus made the dreaded Samaritan the hero, someone be, to be admired. The author of Paul's of, of the gospel according to John loved to take the short witty sayings of Jesus from the other gospels and then turn them into some long complicated speech. But here John is surprisingly clear. Love one another as Jesus loves us. We are here to love one another. That's it. That's the entirety of the Bible. That's the final word on Christian understanding. And like my garden sieve, this is really useful because some pretty terrible ideas have come from what people have wanted to read in the Bible. The Bible was used to justify slavery. But is this loving to deem humans as property? No. It isn't loving, so it gets sifted out. The Bible has been used to inspire racism and colonial conquest of other peoples. Does this fit through our screen of love? Nope. So that interpretation has to go. Can I sit back and not worry about the injustices and suffering of our worldwide siblings? Can I espouse the sacredness of my own individual freedoms, even when it puts my neighbor's life in danger? No, this does not support the law of love, and therefore it cannot be a valid reading of Scripture. And some might think, well, we don't know yet. Well, yeah, we don't. That's Paul's point. Knowledge is temporary. Love is forever. Even if we don't know, we can at least love. And is it justifiable to use the Bible to discriminate and deny the holy humanity of our LGBT neighbors? No, this is not loving and therefore cannot be an accurate understanding of the Bible or the life and teachings of the one we profess to follow. Jesus Christ. Now, this is Pride Week, 
And I'm guessing some of you that are watching find this kind of hard to believe. So, meet me over here at the inclusion cam. I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? For some of you that are watching today, this is not how you've experienced church or Christians. Some of you have been banished or mocked. Some of you have been told that your very existence is an insult to God. And even when you have been welcomed into a church, rather than celebrating who you are, you've been forced into a don't ask, don't tell kind of denial that robs you of your dignity and robs the church of your critical voice. Maybe the wounds are too deep and you'll never step foot into a church again. And that's okay. You have to follow the path that you follow. But please know this. God is so much more than the church or the flawed biases of its people. God does love you. God treasures you. God created you. And God does not make mistakes. Let's go back over here. I also know that some of you here that are watching this may have some concerns about welcoming people that we haven't welcomed in the past, about being an affirming congregation, and this is all just a lot to take. And so if that is you, please meet me over here at the concern cam. I get it. The idea of a Christian church celebrating diversity in gender and sexual orientation is so far from tradition and what we've always been taught. I get that because I used to agree. I was so far on the other side of this issue until I found out how many wonderful, talented, God-gifted people that I knew were gay, but it's being excluded from the church. I had to do some real soul searching to arrive where I am now. But you know, I commend you that you're still watching this video. You could have turned it off a long time ago, but that tells me that you're willing to listen, to have an open mind, to maybe even just trust me a bit. So let me ask you, when you stand before God to have your life weighed, how would you rather be wrong? Do you want to find out that you've spent your time excluding, looking down on, or even persecuting those whom God really, really loves? Or would you rather find out that, that God does exclude our LGBT neighbors, but you've spent your life loving too much, loving too generously? Given everything that I believe about God, everything that I have read about Jesus in the Gospels, I am always going to err on the side of love. Meet me back over here. Every one of us has been given a great gift. The ability to love one another. Yes, that is sometimes difficult. Yes, we've had centuries of complications that obscure the clarity of the law of love, but we have also been given the ability to sift out the dross, take the screen of our life and sift out all that is not loving, all that divides us from our neighbors. And all our lives, if we do this, we'll be richer because we'll be closer to each other. We will find more peace and joy and beauty and we will be closer to God. Generous and when it was safe, visible. 
Thank you, Musha, for showing your pride. Our prayer today has a sung response, which will be printed on the screen. It's called, Listen, God is Calling. Please join me in prayer. Holy One, creating one, loving one, we come together and we celebrate. You have included us in a creation that is far more fantastic than we can ever imagine. Life too small to be seen, or creatures as large as elephants and whales. From the smallest seed and spore to the largest tree, people of all shapes and sizes, languages and traditions, their own ways to love and express the reality that you've built within our souls. We listen for your still speaking voice calling us to celebration. We pray for those around the world who lack so much of what most of us take for granted. Clean water and affordable health care, the ability to simply walk down the street without risking our lives, the right to self-determination and the right not to be forced to live by another's limiting standards, the right to love and marry who we choose. We listen for your still speaking voice calling us to wider awareness and compassion. Listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. We pray for those who have been told that their lives are not worthy, worthy of entering your assembly. There have been too many excluded over the years. People of different ethnicities, people of different political stripes, gays, lesbians, transgender people, and all the rainbow spectrum that comes between. We acknowledge that Christianity has been too quick to draw lines of acceptance and unacceptance. So please help us to realize that the only line is the one that circles all creation, holding us within your embrace. We listen for your still speaking voice, calling us to embrace the hospitality that Christ taught. pray our great thanksgiving that your spirit still blows through our lives, renewing relationships long broken, opening minds that seem forever closed, and calling us to always be open to reimagining who you are, reimagining our understanding of scripture, and always listening for the renewing call of Christ. We listen for your still speaking voice calling us to thankfulness. Closing him today is Though I May Speak. Though I may speak with great despair and hunger give to all inspire and have not love, my words are vain as sowing grass and homeless gain. Give all I possess 
God's love is our guide. God's love is our nourishment and our reason. God's love is ours to share with limitless abandon. Amen.